Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, uh, so Henry David Thoreau. I think I like writing the name in the case like something I know is right. <laughs> <laughs> or start saying something that I'm not sure about. <laughs> um, right, so he was uh, younger than Emerson, but he, he died fairly young. So uh, Emerson lived on and wrote after him. Um, so, uh, but um, since the thing we read by Emerson was so early, uh, it's before the stuff we're reading by Thoreau. <laughs> um, I, you know, like this is going to be a problem after we leave Thoreau. The next few people, like I wasn't sure how to order them because they were all active at the same time. <laughs> so I followed some kind of random instinct. But anyway, um, so. Uh, um, so this essay that was the reading for today, actually, well, so it was originally a speech, just like Emerson's thing that we read. It was originally a, or a lecture, I guess, that he gave in 1848. And at that time, the title was The Rights and Duties of the Individual in Relation to Government. Um, then it was first published the following year in 1849, and then the title was um, Resistance to Civil Government. And then it was later published again with the title that we mostly use for it now, which is Civil Disobedience. Um, as far as I know, the text wasn't changed between those different principles. I, I assume the text is not exactly what he said in the lecture, but I don't know. Um, and, um, this was published, this is also something about the order in which we're reading Thoreau's works. So this, sorry, so this was published, as I just said, in 1849, although it first under a different title. And then um, Walden was published in 1853. However, what makes this a little bit interesting is that this was after the time when he actually lived at Walden. So the years he's writing about in Walden were before this. And in fact, um, the incident he's describing here is something that happened to him while he was living at Walden. So he, al he, he also just, he describes the same incident in Walden, which is interesting to compare. Um, um, And um, right, so the years he was actually at Walden were 1845-7. If you write Walden without underlining it, <laughs> and it means a pawn. <laughs> um, so, uh, I mean, actually, in the book, Walden, I mean, Thoreau played a lot with the fact that Walden is both the name of the pond and the name of the cliff. Um, so anyway, um, um, and just to put this in context of other things we've read, so uh, um, remember, I feel bad that I didn't get to talk very much about the contents of this, uh, um, but I hope you enjoyed reading it. The selection from Martin Luther's Society in America, that was published in 1837. Um, and uh, based on her travels in 1834 through 1835. Um, and Emerson's American scholar was also 1837. And Margaret Fuller, 4th of July, was it's published on the 4th of July in 1845. 
So it's so um, we're still pretty much in the same period. I mean, obviously, the most important thing about the period, although the people in the period don't know this, is that it's leading up to the Civil War. <laughs> um, but it hasn't happened yet. Um, OK, and I guess, I mean, I'm not going to try to say anything about Thoreau or what he was like. Uh, <laughs> I mean, uh, reading even as much as Walden as we're going to read is probably gives a better impression of that than I can. Um, but um, you can also read uh, Emerson's, uh, I don't know what would be the word for this, eulogy, I guess, <laughs> for Thoreau that he published after his death, which um, says some other things about what he was like. Um, um, but I guess the one other thing I'll say is that um, that original title, before it was called Civil Disobedience, the title of the lecture, The Rights and Duties of the Individual in Relation to Government, I think, makes it actually clearer why this this um, belongs to the middle of this course. <laughs> um, that's, you know, it's it's really about the exact same things I keep talking about. Um, and you can see right away that Thoreau has drawn the exact conclusion that Bentham thought was so absurd. Um, so this is a, um, page 211, the authority of government, even such as I am willing to submit to, is this really what I want to read? Yeah, I guess it is. The authority of government, even such as I am willing to submit to, is still an impure one. To be strictly just, it must have the sanction and consent of the governed. It can have no pure right over my person and property, but what I concede to it. Right, so that's saying that um, the government needs my consent every time. <laughs> um, it's not as not enough that like at some time people consented to form this government, or even that at some time I first consented to this government. Um, the um, Thoreau is saying that the government has no authority without my consent on every occasion. <laughs> um, so, and again, like that's what Bentham calls striking at the root of government. And, you know, of course, uh, um, he is striking at the root of government. Uh, so, you know, so at the, the beginning of the essay, he says, um, and, and, and claiming that, um, like agreeing with Bentham that Jefferson's principles rightly understood are striking at the root of government, right? So he says, I hardly accept the motto that government is best, which governs least. Now that motto, I, I think this that motto has often been erroneously attributed to Jefferson. I mean, you can find out about this the same way I did by like Googling it or whatever, but that motto has often been erroneously attributed to Jefferson. Apparently Jefferson never says or wrote that himself, but um, it was the motto of a newspaper. Did I write down the title of the newspaper? No, it was, a, it was a motto of a popular magazine. Should have written down the title of the magazine, but you could find out if you're interested. Um, There's a motto of a popular magazine that was associated with Jefferson's party, the Democratic Republicans, right? So, I mean, so just by saying that, he's already associating with Jefferson. I hardly accept the motto that government is, that government is best which governs least. Carried out, it finally amounts to this, which I also believe, that government is best which governs not at all. <laughs> um, um, and so, by the way, what did the real Jefferson think about this? Um, so, um, 
this is part, so like I said, I thought about assigning part of Jefferson's notes on the state of Virginia. I mean, I guess one reason I didn't was because there was no room for it in the syllabus. They also said another reason for it is that uh, um, it is fairly offensive. <laughs> Um, but there are interesting things in it. So here's something that Jefferson says in notes on the state of Virginia. And he's talking about the American Indians or Native Americans, um, or Americans, as Locke calls them. <laughs> anyway, um, this is what he says. They're only control. So he's talking about how they don't have like governments, basically. Now, obviously, he means, and this is pretty common, I think, people talk about the American Indians, they don't mean like the Aztecs. <laughs> I mean, they have a government, obviously. Um, they, so he means like the people who are in Virginia, basically. Now, I mean, whether even that is accurate or not, I don't know, but that's not what's important here. But you'll see what Jefferson says about it. Their only controls are their manners and that, and that moral sense of right and wrong, which like the sense of tasting and feeling in every man makes a part of his nature. An offense against these is punished by contempt, by exclusion from society, or where the case is serious as that of murder by the individuals whom it concerns. Imperfect as this species of coercion may seem, crimes are very rare among them insomuch that, that were it made a question whether no law as among the savage Americans or too much law as among the civilized Europeans submits man to the greater evil, one who has seen both conditions of existence would pronounce it to be the last and that the sheep are happier of themselves than under care of the wolves. <laughs> right, so the Emerson, Jefferson himself is saying that actually these people who were without government were happier than Europeans without government. Um, I mean, he's talking about law, but well, no, he's talking about both, as you can see from the next sentence. By the way, if you think about that sentence, the sheep are happier of themselves than under care of the wolves. Um, like, it means that Jefferson's diagnosis of what's going on here is the same as Nietzsche's. <laughs> even though they don't have the same valuation as Nietzsche would say. <laughs> so in any case, it will be said that great societies cannot exist without governments, right? That's an objection that Jefferson is entertaining. Answer, the savages therefore break them into small ones, <laughs> right? So, um, so he's saying like great societies actually like who needs them? They make us unhappy. They they require government and law. So I mean, so I think both Bentham and uh, um, Thoreau are are correct to attribute this kind of tendency to Jefferson. I mean, it didn't prevent Jefferson from from doing all the Jefferson things that he did. Right? So I mean, it's. Um, uh, there has to be another side to the story, but it's 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 really true that this is this kind of thought is is implicit in his principles. Um, so anyway, be that as it may, um, Thoreau is definitely drawing that conclusion, and um, Is he drawing it for the same reasons that Jefferson draws it in that quote? Not really, actually. I just thought of this now. I should have thought of it before I quoted Jefferson. Jefferson, that's quote says we'll be happier without law. And that's why we shouldn't have law. But Thoreau is saying we shouldn't have law because there's no authority. Right, it's it's actually a quite different argument. What so it's not even though Jefferson may be sympathetic to the conclusion, and even though his principles may imply it, he's not making this argument. But we have someone who, seen someone who does make the same argument, namely Jonathan Edwards. Right, so like this is here's something Thoreau says that um, 
could just as well be in Jonathan Edwards. The only obligation which I have a right to assume is to do at any time what I think right. Right, so that's saying, you know, like what I said about the untenability of promises according to a certain point of view, like Edward's point of view, um, that um, um, I don't have a discretion that I, where I can choose between different, you know, where like, I could have done any of these things and now I can like reduce that discretion by making a promise. That's that's the presupposition of promises. You have there has to be like a realm of things that you have a right to do any of them. And then I mean how this works is still hard to understand, but then somehow you're able to contract that realm to like lay down some of your rights. Um, as as I mean, that's that's the language Hobbes uses when he talks about the covenant that forms uh, um, a new commonwealth. Everyone lays down some of their rights. So you have these rights to do any of these things, but you like lay down some of them until you're left with the right <coughs> to do the thing you promised. But Thoreau is saying, and I think we saw the same thing in Edwards that. Um, uh really uh you never had the right to do all of those things you only have ever had the right to do um what you think is right <laughs> and therefore that's the only obligation you could assume and of course that obligation assuming that obligation doesn't change anything right but it's assume the obligation to do what you think is right well of course you're already under an obligation to do what you think is right <laughs> so it really means that you can't assume any obligation. I mean, it doesn't mean that you don't have obligations. On the contrary, you, the reason you can't assume an obligation is because you already have so many. <laughs> um, um However, I guess there's something that in that sentence that um, that although maybe Edwards did agree with, I think is not emphasized by Edwards, um, which is the only obligation which I have a right to assume is to do at any time what I think is right. Um, that is like if I think it right now that the right thing to do and like we have a I mean it's not clear whether Thoreau and Edwards I think they don't agree about what question we're asking we ask what what is what is what is right <laughs> um, but um but like leaving aside what that's about, the question, the, the issue is this. If I decide now that the right thing for me to do, to do tomorrow will be X, I can say I'm definitely going to do X because I think that's the right thing to do tomorrow. But if tomorrow it looks different like, to me, it no longer that X no longer seems like the right thing to do. Thoreau is saying, well, you know. The fact that you thought it was right yesterday is irrelevant. You can't be bound by that. Because right now, you think it's wrong, so you, you're not allowed to do it. <laughs> um, so, um, um, You're not allowed to try to be consistent. Right? I mean, if there's one quote you've heard from Emerson from self reliance, which he didn't read, if there's one quote you've heard from that essay, is probably about the foolish consistency is the hobgoblin of small minds. Right? This is this that Emerson's concern. I think this is this is like characteristic of New England transcendentalism. 
Emerson, the reason Emerson thinks consistency is foolish consistency, that he thinks that is trying, I think a foolish consistency means trying to get consistency for its own sake. <laughs> um, and Emerson in that essay says consistency and conformity are the two things that, um, well, what? They're two bad things. <laughs> without without getting into the details of what he said there, it's hard to say more than that. But right, because they're they, because they're both things where um, I submit my will to something external. In the case of conformity, I'm con submitting my will to other people. In the case of consistency, I'm submitting my will to some former the will of former me. Right. So, um, so but what this means in a political context is that any government. So let's suppose we have a government that's founded initially on principles. Um, at the next moment it becomes a particular and unjustifiable authority over its subject, no matter how good the principles were. Now, I mean, we know Thoreau uh, doesn't think the principles were that good either. Well, I mean, he says from a certain standpoint, this government is something good, but from a higher standpoint, it isn't. <laughs> so, but 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 the point is like it almost doesn't matter because um, um, founding a government on principles means deciding now what is right, using that to institute the government, and then promising to do it tomorrow, even if it seems tomorrow it seems like it's not right. Right. So I think this is what. Um, Thoreau is talking about that. <laughs> you can see that the first page of the essay, I made like a million marks and <laughs> there's so many important things here. So, um, right, so back on page 189, the, this American government, what is it but a tradition, though a recent one, endeavoring to transmit itself unimpaired to posterity, but each instant losing some of its integrity? Right, that's what Emerson is talking about. I mean, Thoreau is talking about there. Every instant, it necessarily loses its integrity. Um, and, you know, of course, this is going to be limited to governments. I think, like, a more radical thing is what Thoreau says. Well, well quite a bit later on page 202, right? He talks about this thing. So I guess, I mean, I'm not familiar with the details here, but I guess the idea was, and this is still the rule in some European countries or whatever, that like the government will collect money on, the, on behalf of different churches and like distribute it. And if you're enrolled in that church, then you have to pay, right? So Thoreau like had been enrolled with, some church that his father was enrolled with or whatever. And they came and said, it's time to pay. And so he had to go through a thing to get himself taken off the list, right? And then he says at the end of the paragraph, if I had known how to name them, I should then have signed off in detail from all the societies which I, which from all the societies which I never signed on to, but I did not know where to find a complete list. I, I, so that it, well, all the societies they never signed on to. Even that doesn't support my reading. Does it mean that there were some other societies that he had signed on to and he wouldn't take himself off that list? Yeah. Um, I remember Hobbes and Leviathan talks about uh, part of the role of government is to like educate the people or propagandize them. Yeah. I'm curious. Um, what 
Well, um, so I, I mean, Like the simple answer would be, well, like Thoreau doesn't think that what Hobbes calls education is education. I think that's propaganda, right? But I mean, I think um, in Walden, Thoreau talks about how he had experimented with getting his living by being a school teacher. And uh, he says um, that he found that he was forced to, um, forget the whole list, but he was forced to dress and something accordingly, not to mention believe, <laughs> right? So in other words, it was like, it's like he says, well, it wasn't worth the, you know, the salary wasn't worth it because I had to dress better. And then he says, oh, and by the way, I was, I was supposed to believe accordingly also, right? So this was not the profession for me, right? So he's, um, I think that, yeah, someone who has his the attitude he's expressing here towards government wouldn't be able to participate in that process of education. Um, it's, you know, uh, again, Nietzsche says something similar in, um, but he says it specifically with respect to philosophy in, uh, I think this is in Schopenhauer's Educator, I'm not sure, it's in one of the Untimely Meditations. He says, like, um, a philosopher can never work for a university. And he says he can never work for a public university, like, you know, for, because that's the kind of university they have. But the truth is, his reason would apply even to a private university, I think, right? He says a philosophy, philosopher can never work for a university because a philosopher couldn't promise to appear at a certain time on a certain day and say something, whether they had anything to say or not. <laughs> right. So, um, so uh, you might ask, is that true? Why are you working for a university? <laughs> I don't know. Good question. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, it's a good question. Although, like, it's, I'm not going to concede the premise that I agree with everything that Thoreau or Nietzsche <laughs> said, but. Uh, but yeah, I mean, there, so there is a problem there with education, even if it's not so propagandistic. I mean, like, how do you drag out your own biases or whatever? Like, you can try, but you don't have to sustain Oh, I guess, but Thoreau is, is putting it saying it's the other way around, right? The problem is that you can't express your own biases. So your own biases are what you think are true at any given time. Right, so, uh, um, but you can't because, the, you know, the job is working for an institution, um, promising in advance to do certain things, whether they appear right to you at the time or not. Yeah. Girls, so you have any form of organization with them? Because I feel like with the teaching thing, it's issued or that he's forced to dress in a certain way that he didn't have any impact, no impact on it. If he can make something where, he, where everyone was able to put in the that technology should work, would that, you know, would that work? And that wouldn't last a amount of time. Right? I mean, yeah, it wouldn't. So, like, so first of all, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm deliberately giving the the really radical content of Thoreau's message, right? Then he qualifies it afterwards by saying that. Well, you know, so that is unlike Voltaire and Declare, who we're going to be reading later. He says, "Well, I'm not one of those no government men," which I guess we, is is the word he's using, the phrase he's using for what we mean by anarchist, right? He's saying, "I'm not demanding no government right now. I'm just demanding a better government." It turns out that I mean, because his of the stringency of his demand for the ways the government must be better immediately. It turns out there's actually maybe not that much difference between the two in his particular case, right? Because of slavery and the Mexican-American war. Um, 
He's saying that, uh, yeah, there's some things that can be that that can be tolerated as an evil because they're necessary for certain purposes, but not this. I can't have anything to do with it. Anyway, but sorry, that was kind of uh, a digression. But um, so you know, um, um, but. Uh, but I think in principle, um, I mean, we'll see what he says about cooperation in Walden. He says the only cooperation that is commonly possible is exceedingly slight and superficial. Um, and the true cooperation that that exists is invisible. It's like an invisible harmony. <laughs> Hey, um, so which I mean, which I think he means um, the kind of association that's possible is the kind that works by pre-established harmony. Basically. <laughs> so it's like not instituted. Um, now, like how that connects with So, I mean, uh, I mean, in this essay, Thoreau says what he thinks about like politicians and legislators and statesmen and whatever. Um, and so like, I mean, it's, it's pretty clear that at least if this may be necessary, but but for him, he's not going to get involved in party politics or anything like that. Um, in Walden, he lists voting along with flattery and a bunch of other things as the like mean uh, uh, expedience people take to like ingratiate themselves with others. <laughs> and he also says, because you know in I hope we're not giving well. So some of these things are not even going to be in the assigned reading from Walla. So like the, the bean field. So like he spent a lot of time. The, at least the first year he was at Walden, he spent a lot of time growing, cultivating beans. Um, so um, and he says uh, he didn't cultivate them for eating because he says I am a Pythagorean as far as beans are concerned, whether they mean porridge or voting. <laughs> Right, because they used to vote by like putting beans in an urn, or something, right? So, um, and Pythagoreans, you probably might not know this, Pythagoreans were not allowed to eat beans. We don't know why. <laughs> anyway, that was one of the things Pythagoras apparently told his followers. So, uh, right. So, um, however, on the other hand, there's another time in Walden where he says where he talks about um how many people could fit into his house and he says um i had three chairs one for solitude two for company and three for so society i think is what he says and then he and he says if there were more than three there was only if there were more than that there was only the one extra chair for all of them <laughs> but commonly they economized space by standing up <laughs> imagine instead they all tried to sit on so um, then he says uh, that at one time he had, I think he says 25 and 25 souls with their bodies inside my house at the same time. And yet it didn't feel particularly crowded, right? So uh, like when was it that he had 25 souls inside his house? It was an abolitionist meeting. So like he was involved in associations of some I mean, how could you not raise like um, but I guess again the question would be like how he viewed his relation to those associations. I think I mean he also talks about when he went to the village to visit the village, he says like um that 
off and he would suddenly disappear and no one would know his whereabouts. <laughs> so like, I guess the picture is that he's in the village walking along with his friends and all of a sudden he sees a break in the fence and he's like, Shh. <laughs> and off across the fields back into the woods and no one knows what happens. <laughs> um, so like, I yeah, I think the answer is that he, um, it's similar to the government. He's not out to destroy associations and he'll deal with them if it's useful, right? But he's not gonna like submit his own will to them. Does that, okay. Um, um, Okay, and so I guess, so the one other thing I wanted to say about this is that it's, you know, I mean, it's, been, it's a form of the problem people always have with social contract theory, right? I mean, usually it's thought of in terms of future generations, right? Like the first generation made the social contract, and then how is that going to be transmitted? Um, so, I mean, it's easy for Hobbes because Hobbes says, well, like if you're conquered, then you're 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 required to obey your conqueror, right? And so, like as I understand it, Hobbes thinks that every um, child that's born into existing commonwealth is basically like conquered by the rest of the commonwealth, <laughs> right? Like they're too weak to resist, and so they submit. And that for Hobbes, that legitimates the government. <laughs> but for most other social contract theorists, this is a problem. Right. So, but what I'm saying is that the the Thoreau like um, applies that even to stages of his own self. Right. Like even if my past self agreed to the compact, how could that be transmitted to my future selves? You don't have to go from one generation to the next to have a problem. Um. Okay, so that's, you know, um, um, that's Thoreau's radical position about government here. But now, like I said, I want to, we haven't really said what he means when he says that you have to do what you think is right. Like, what are you thinking about when you ask whether something is right? Um, I mean, maybe this is actually is a kind of continuation of what I was just saying, because but anyway, so here it is. So like, all right. Um, of course, it's nice. Um, got a con and a science, <laughs> right? So unlike Edwards. Thoreau associates doing what you think is right with following your conscience. Acting from acting from principle, um, meaning, of course, again, not the principle you acknowledged yesterday, but the principle you see now, right, is, is acting from conscience. So, um, So I wasn't able to get into this before uh, when I talked about Edwards. I don't think I managed to say anything about conscience when I talked about Edwards, it, um, but it was part of the signed reading. So for Edwards, conscience is, um, it's a subordinate, it's like a merely natural physical motive as opposed to a divine motive. So that, right, the divine motive is, um, doing things for the same reason God would do, universal benevolence. This is according to Edwards. So, but doing things for a physical motive or a natural motive means that, um, of course, you're still doing, you're still acting for a reason that God set up, but you're not like recognizing God's reason for setting that up. I'm sorry, that's pretty confusing, but um, well, I mean, let me just try to talk about this example. 
So the point is, so Edward says, like, due to certain natural facts about human beings, certain natural laws that we follow, in the end, we tend to, we have a tendency to approve of the things that are actually right and to disapprove of the things that are actually wrong. That they have a tendency to approve of true virtue and disapprove of vice. Um, but the tendency, um, that natural tendency doesn't come from recognizing the principle of universal benevolence and deducing from that what is to be approved of and what is to be disapproved of. It comes from, so in other words, conscience is like um, a tendency that to do the right things, but not for the right reason. Or to approve of the right, to do or approve of the right things, but not for the right reason. And he says, like, it's basically comes, it's a combination of factors. One is a desire for self consistency. Now, this is a different, this is different from the temporal consistency that I was just talking about and it, it, um, that worries Emerson and Thoreau. By self consistency, he means, Edward means, like, it makes me uneasy to, um do something which I would disapprove of if someone else did it to me. It feels like there's a contradiction there. So that's a tendency that makes me not want to do things that I would disapprove of in others. And secondly, we have this approval for justice as a kind of um order or fittingness, the fittingness of the punishment to the crime or the right which is an example of what Edwards calls secondary beauty, right? He says that's basically, we approve of that for the same reason we approve of like harmony in music or something like that. The parts fit together. So like when you put those two, two things together, you, you get the like, um, you associate, um, punishment with people doing bad things to you and then you um, um, you don't want to do the same things both because there's a feeling of inconsistency and because you associate it with something bad namely punishment <laughs> so I mean so anyway Edward says that that like that when a conscience is working properly, it will cause you to approve of and do exactly the right things. But it's, again, it's not for the right reason. The reason these things are right is because, you, you know, that you should have uh, a love for all beings as such or whatever. But the reason you're doing them is because of these considerations of consistency and fittingness, right? They, like basically because they, um, because they're like pretty, because they're beautiful in the sense that you know a flower is beautiful. Something like that. That's that. That's secondary beauty. That's not true beauty. All right. So all of that is Edwards. That's why Edwards says that that conscience. So like it's not a bad thing, but it's. I mean, the, and I guess what I was trying to explain before is like. You can understand why God would implant these tendencies because God wants the effects of universal benevolence, right? I mean, having the principle of universal benevolence means you, you want not only yourself, but everyone to do what's good for everyone else, right? So like, this is a way to get them to do it, to implant these tendencies in us. Um, but the people who are following the tendencies don't know that that's God's reason. They're just following their own tendencies. So, um, so it's like a good thing, but it doesn't show that the people that affects themselves are good. <laughs> um, um, And the reason I said maybe this is really a, a version of the same thing I was talking about before. So I think Thoreau is under. I'm kind of out of order here. 
Um, right, I guess so. All right, so this is the way this is this is the way to lead into this thought. So like um Anderson, I mean Edwards is saying that you shouldn't act from conscience, you should work from act from explicit recognition of the principle. That's what gives your action, as Kant would say, moral work, right? You're, you're, that's when you're doing it for the right reason. But for Thoreau, because of the things we were just talking about, um, if um, if you want to, so to speak, access universal principles correctly, you can't do it by trying to figure, like, write down a list of explicit principles. Um, like, that process of trying to, like, do demonstrations um, or arrive at consistent first principles that you're going to do to fit. All of that involves this problem of like um, doing what seems wrong now because it seemed right at the previous step, right? Like you want to um, you want to work out a system so that um, so that like you've proved that these are the principles that should guide you. And from now on, um, uh, you won't have to think anymore. You'll just have to consult the principles. That's the whole point of working on principles. So, like, I mean, whether this would actually be a fair criticism of uh, I mean, I think it would be a fair criticism of Edward the way he actually portrays moral decisions. Uh, I mean, but you could say to Edwards, isn't isn't what you mean really? Because I mean, of course, like uh, uh, the divine intellect is not this person. Like God doesn't have to prove principle. So I don't know. Anyway, but getting back to Thoreau. So, so, so how do you access universal principles? Not by trying to state explicit principles, but instead by trying to follow your own individual nature. And this really is, a, I mean, even though, yeah, I guess I could put it this way. It turns out the two things that Edwards wants to separate for Thoreau is, are the same. Right, like following the nature that was given you, and that if that is something good, if you could only follow that accurately, um, is the same as acting from principle. And the other thing that you call acting from principle is actually not acting from principle because it's acting from like yesterday's principle. <laughs> The last instance principle. Um, so, like on this view, you know, when when we go wrong, it's because we're um, um, somehow wrong about what our nature is, or we're wrong about it, or we're we're trying to. Um, Submit it to conformity or consistency. That's what's going to make you go wrong. Um, right? So, like, here's something he says on page 197. This is near the top of the page. Action from principle, the perception and the performance of right changes things and relations 
it is essentially revolutionary and does not consist wholly with anything which was. Right, so that's, that's I think, is where he's saying pretty explicitly what I just said, that um, true action from principle is never consistent. I mean, it is consistent, but the consistency is um, some is like supplied by what you are rather than by what you think. Um, right, so this means, you know, what does this mean? Thoreau actually do this? I mean, he, you know, he says things in this essay that sound like statements of principle. Um, but um, I guess, I mean, part of this is, so like sometimes, I didn't talk about this, but at one point in Emerson's American Scholar, he says something like, um, I think he's talking about how like books, like right before this, he says books are for the scholars idle time, <laughs> right? The like, you know, um, um, if you're not strong enough to go out and act and experience and you're you're feeling like idle, well, then you can read a book, right? But then in the next paragraph, Emerson says, but um, I, I wouldn't let any love of system for, you know, make me underrate books. And then he starts talking about how great books are, right? And that, that transition there is key, it's like, um, you know, uh, true, I just said something that, that deprecates the value of books. But actually, books can be great. Now I think about it, they seem great, so I'm going to say that. <laughs> and it would be wrong to let a love of system like interfere with that. Um, so in other words, um, If you were to check through Thoreau's work and see, does he ever recognize a principle? And then say, oh, look, stating a principle. Thoreau, you've been inconsistent. Thoreau would say, well, of course, didn't I just tell you you shouldn't try to be consistent? <laughs> are you listening? <laughs> right. So, I mean, it's. Uh, Um, it's a difficult position to express. Um, I think, you know, uh, this essay, Civil Disobedience, um, is one where Thoreau tries to express it in an easier to understand form, as compared to Walden, where um, um, which I'll talk about next time where where the like the difficulty of saying what he's trying to say which is um, like goes back and alters the form of the text. It, it no longer contains, I mean it does here and there, but it no longer contains arguments like this essay contains. <laughs> And a lot of times he seems to be talking about fish and stuff. I mean, he is talking about fish. And you're like, that's interesting, but why? <laughs> right. Um, so, um, and so, I mean, I'll try to say a little bit, you know, as much as I can in one lecture next time about some of the details of what's going on in Walden. But I think like the overall answer to that question is that. I mean, it's an idea that's going around in the 19th century. It's it's in Emerson and Thoreau, it's in Bethany Nietzsche, it's in Kierkegaard, that like the really important thing that has to be said can't be said directly. 
you, you always have to hide it somehow. Um, so, um, so here in this essay, he's not doing that so much. And I think that's why, you know, to explain it, I end up having to say something like, oh, this, this sounds so self-undermining. Um, right, like, yeah, you shouldn't be try to be consistent. So that means that sometimes you can try to be consistent. <laughs> um, uh, okay, so, um, so the conclusion of all of this seems to be that, um, you know, government is impossible. Um, and not only government, but, but like, so like voluntary association is impossible. Um, uh, and I think what he tries to say about that is that um you put it in terms of like a lower point of view and a higher point of view lower point of view um The lower point of view involves acknowledging that for people as they are, government is a necessity. Um, put that right still. I wanted to quote Walden again. Oh. Here it is. So it's like another page later in my notes, which means I'm probably getting myself even more confused. But never mind, I'll read it now. This it's in the it's in the reading for next time. It's uh yeah, I think it is. Um some things are really necessaries of life in some circles, the most helpless and diseased, which in others are luxuries merely, and in others still are entirely unknown. Ray, that you know what what's necessary for life is um, relative to like as we might say now what you all are ready for, <laughs> right? Like if you're, I mean, if you're helpless and diseased, then it, it may be necessary. And you know he has a long he has a list of things that are necessary for us in our climate now clothing fuel shelter whatever but you know uh, if we were stronger and healthier those things wouldn't be necessary um, so I, I think you know he's saying the same thing about government yeah. it is it's necessary for like. It's necessary because people are so far from following their conscience. They're so far from doing this that um, um, that they need someone else to tell them what to do. Um, so, right, so that's and and Thoreau doesn't deny that there's better and worse ways of having that happen. Right? Like, I mean, I think that's what he means when he says things like, well, this constitution from some lower point of view is actually an admirable thing. But from a higher point of view, no. <laughs> right? He's, you know, I mean, people need something like this. They need to hear the machinery of government going. Says at one point, right? Like they they can't sleep without that noise. Um, this is also similar to um, something he says in Walden about um, 
um, how uh, like an ordinary person would have wouldn't have been able to stand living where he lived because there was no noise of a tea kettle or the you know um, of uh, chickens or children or whatever right like so. Um, people need to hear that noise. They can't sleep without that noise. So for them, it's a necessity of life. But that's a disease. <laughs> it's a disease to need that. So therefore, I mean, and I think this is the crucial thing because like um, you could go from saying that to say that therefore as things are, we have a certain like um, um, obligation to obey, obey the government because it's necessary for people the way they are. Like this is what um, when I mentioned before William Godwin, who was a British anarchist and um, who was influenced by Jonathan Edwards, um, with, you know, has this really uncompromising anarchist position based on a kind of utilitarianism. But then he says, you know, but this doesn't mean that I advise people to break the law right now. That will bring much more disutility. And people aren't ready for it, right? So he's like, um, and you know, I mean, he's also strongly pacifist, basically, right? So he says, like, the only, the, the way to change people is to tell them the truth, not to use violence. <laughs> right, so, um, so, uh, um, so you can imagine Thoreau taking in that position. Of course, I'm going to be a good citizen, even though in principle government has no legitimacy. I'm going to be a good citizen because as things are now, the government is necessary. But, um, but with his particular explanation of what it means that government is necessary, that doesn't exactly follow, right? Because it's like his explanation is, it's like, you know, um, if some people are so diseased that they need to wear a lot of clothing, they, you know, or else they'll freeze to death, um, then that's their problem. If I'm healthy, I don't need to, I don't need to. Right. Um, so, um, so, so what does this come out to? I mean, it means that Thoreau, um, uh, I mean, I guess you would say, so like Godwin, he's not advocating for a movement of revolution and overthrow the government. Um, I mean, that just wouldn't work, right? Like if people were persuaded by him, they would be, they would be doing exactly the kind of thing that he says they shouldn't do. Um, so, um, um, I mean, this is why it's, I think, part of the ambiguity of, and the way the title changed. They, first, it was called resistance to civil government, right? So then it's clear that the civil refers to what you're disobeying. You're disobeying the civil, the civil government. But in this new title, civil disobedience, it becomes ambiguous. Like, does it mean you're disobeying in a civil way? <laughs> or does it mean, so, I mean, it, it's, um, you know, the way Thoreau resists the government is he they ask him to pay his taxes and he doesn't pay. So then they say, well, we're going to have to arrest you. And he says, OK. <laughs> um, and then, you know, like Socrates, only with more success, his, you know, his unfaithful friends come and get him out of prison by paying his tax bill. Um, so, and then he, he like goes off and goes Huckleberry. Um, so like he doesn't, um, he 
He doesn't go try to like seize the um, um, the federal armory at Harper's Ferry and start a revolt. I mean, uh, that happened after this, right? The Harper's Ferry thing was in 1815. I just looked it up, maybe 1855, maybe. I think it was after the publication of Walden, but he knew John Brown. Afterwards, he, you know, said something, wrote something in defense of John Brown. Um, but that's, you know, that's that's not the way this radical rejection of the authority of government is going. Um, But um, so we need some right order. Right, so I guess, okay. What, yeah, maybe I should get it from this point of view. So why do we get that difference between Godwin and Thoreau? Right, like, um, I mean, neither of them is an advocate for like violent revolutionary movements. But, um, but Godwin goes farther and says, as things are, you should, for the most part, almost always obey the law. Even though human beings have no authority to legislate. Um, and even though you can't have accepted an obligation to obey the law, that doesn't make sense. Still, as things are, you should um, almost always obey the law. Whereas Thoreau says, like if you understand if you understand this, if you're if you see that you don't need government, then um, um, you should absolutely not obey the law if the law is asking you to be an agent of injustice in any way. Um, so, like, I think the difference is that, as I said, Godwin, um, like Edwards, had, you know, is, is thinking of this in terms of a kind of utilitarian criterion, um, which the Roman is as they call it, expediency. I mean, it's it's basically the same thing that uh, we already saw uh, Jefferson in the Declaration alluding to in Locke. So re remember, uh, there's that thing about how, like, in the Declaration of Independence, about how um, long-standing governments are not to be lightly overthrown, right? But when a long train of abuses, et cetera, et cetera. Right, and as, as I pointed out, that's alluding, it's almost word for word what Locke says about the right of rebel, right or duty of rebellion. Right, that it's like, um, in principle, as soon as the government is going against your inalienable rights, um, you should rebel against it. But Locke says, well, hold on, but you have to balance that against the bad effects. It's going to be a bad effect if you um, if you start a civil war, basically, which is what we're talking about doing. So should you do it? Well, like, how bad is the alternative? Um, and Locke says, um, 
In fact, Locke says this in, in answer to an objector, right? Someone would have checked, hey, Locke, you're, you're encouraging people to constantly rebel against the government, whatever. And Locke will say, well, no, I mean, actually, uh, um, people are almost never going to want to rebel against the government. It's almost always a lot more trouble than it's worth. <laughs> um, so, um, so, and that's basically the same thing that Godwin is saying. I mean, with the proviso that, with the difference that he thinks every government is illegitimate. <laughs> But this, but that but that calculation still holds, right? Like so, every government you should rebel against in principle, but you have to weigh the bad effects of rebelling against, you know. And and Godwin says agrees with Locke. It's almost always going to come out. No, don't do it. In fact, as I said, Godwin thinks that that like violence is almost never justified you know, of any kind. Um. So, uh, whereas Thoreau says that this principle of expediency is itself part of the lower form of um, Right, so like here on page 193, So he's quoting uh, William, is that his first name? William Paley. Um, um, uh, popular British preacher and ethicist, uh, like around the same time as Godwin and these other, all these other people. Um, so uh, this is what he quotes Paley as saying. This principle being admitted, the justice of every particular case of resistance is reduced to a computation of the quantity of the danger and grievance on the one side and of the probability and expense of redressing it on the other. Right? That's so that's Paley's restatement of that same thing I was saying that's in Locke and, and Godwin. That you know, when you ask whether to resist the government, then you it's always a calculation. The bad effects of resistance versus the probability that it will achieve something good, and you do out the calculation, and you get you know answer either do it or don't. Um, and Thoreau says, but Paley appears never to have contemplated those cases to which the rule of expediency does not apply, in which a people as well as an individual must do justice, cost what it may. And what's an example of that? So this is why, as I said, like Thoreau's qualification of his position turns out not to mean as much as you might think, because this people must cease to hold slaves and to make war on Mexico, though it cost them their existence as a people. Um, so that like, um, the person looking from a higher point of view can't use this principle of expediency because um, um, because they know that this principle of expediency doesn't apply to every case. There are some, some things that you can't be a part of um, no matter what the effect. Um, like, I don't know exactly how this is connected with the other, it must be somehow connected with the other disagreement between Thoreau and Edwards. But it's not connected in any simple way. I mean, because because like, so what Thoreau just said about expediency is what, what Kant says about expediency, right? Like the famous thing where the ax murderer comes to your door and asks, you know, is the person I wanna murder hiding in your house? And Kant says, 
that um, you're not allowed to lie. And that if you do lie, so let's say you say, oh no, they're not in my house. And the ax murderer goes off and kills someone else. That like, you're liable. <laughs> because by your unlawful act, the ax murderer was sent off to do this, right? So, um, um, and yet, of course, on the issue of like conscience versus principle, Kant is closer to Edwards than to Thoreau. So, I mean, so these things don't go together in some simple way, and yet somehow I feel like they do go together. Um, I mean, like I said, they both seem to be, Thoreau seems to somehow include both in the, I mean, maybe this is the connection. Um, Sorry that I'm working this out. This is the first time I've taught this class. <laughs> so I'm working this out as I go. Um, so um, I think the connection is probably again to this idea of what's necessary. Like what are the necessaries of life? Um, the, um, the calculation of expediency has to do with thinking that the necessary of life are things that you can like um, trade for other things. Um, so you can do a calculation and see how much it comes out to. And the higher point of view is that the necessities of life aren't like that. So like at one point in Walden, Thoreau says, um that when people ask him something like how you can survive on vegetable food alone he says he's tempted to, i'm tempted to answer that i can survive on board nails <laughs> and if and if they can't understand that they can't understand much of what i have to say right like what does that mean i can survive on you know i mean it doesn't mean you can eat nails but he's saying that there's a higher point of view. It's not just that fewer things are necessary if you're healthy. It's that there's a higher point of view on what necessity is. Um, so, um, now, I mean, I think that's right. Although I have to admit that it's there's something more complicated than that. And you may be wondering if I'll get back to the question about the existence of America or anything like that. Um, uh, I'm not sure I will or not, but, but, but what I have to talk about first is this thing about where he says, well, the principle of expediency can allow you to get along with some things and not with others. That's, you know, that's the thing I don't quite understand based on what I was just saying, because, you know, so he says, like, um, yeah, so once you admit that government is a necessity, it's going to be a machine and it's going to be some friction in the machine. And you can't complain about that. Um, and then he says, right, so there's a certain amount of injustice is just part of the way governments have to work. And once you accept that there's going to be one, you can't complain about that. Now, I mean, what if you can't complain about that? I mean, I think he draws the line as being made the agent of injustice. So, like, for him personally, that, like, not being able to complain about it doesn't mean that much. But, but anyway, you know, and then he says, well, but if the injustice has its own crank or pulley or whatever, so it's not just friction in the machine, then he says that's the time for calculations of expediency. Um, but I'm like, what's the third case where the whole machine is built to do something unjust? <laughs> I, you would think that's the third case, but that's not exactly how he says it. Um, in the passage, 197 to 198. 
If the injustice is part of the necessary friction of the machine of government, let it go, let it go. Perchance it will wear smooth. Certainly the machine will wear out. If the injustice has a spring or a pulley or a rope or a crank exclusively for itself, then perhaps you may consider whether the remedy will not be worse than the evil. But if, if it is such a nature that it requires you to be the agent of injustice to another, then I say, break the law. Right, so I was getting different things confused there. Don't know how to put those together. If the justice is just part of this, seems like the third case that uh, is in parallel to the first two cases. Hmm. The first case is the injustice is just the friction of the machine. The second case is the injustice has its own pulley. And um, the third case is you're required to be an agent. So it seems like in either of these cases, you could be required to be an agent. Right, so maybe it's really not a three-part classification, even though it sounds like it. So, you know, so that would mean this this actually is important. It is this is a way of getting back to the question about America, about the status of America, according to him. Um is his refusal to go along with, to support slavery and the Mexican war, right? So and being an agent of injustice here is, right, it's in a pretty weak sense. He, he, he says it's not even that he thinks the money that he's giving, his taxes is gonna go to that purpose. Right? He says, I'm, I'm not going to like split hairs and try to figure out where all my money goes or anything like that. He says, the, the problem is just the act of submission and paying the taxes to the go a government that's doing this makes him complicit. So, um, so the question is, um, these two mean that there are certain injustices that he would be willing to be complicit in? Of course, you could explain that on the expediency. Right? Then you could say, yeah, if the injustice is, and that sounds like that's where he's going with these two, right? Like if the injustice is um, um, something the machine will probably take care of itself in time, or at least it will break down. And like there's no, like what you could do now by smashing the machine would not improve things. Then let it go. You know, if the Injustice is more than just friction of the machine, then you have to ask if it's worth the trouble to try to fix the machine or not. Then you might think that this is what I was starting to say, but if the whole machine is is like focused on that. And the reason I say this is relevant to the question about America is that a lot of times now. I think maybe not so much then, but for Thoreau, yes. <laughs> that the question about the status of America might come down to something like, well, you hear people put it this way, like, is the system broken and it needs to be fixed? Or 
is the system doing exactly what it's designed to do, that it needs to be destroyed? Right, so you, like you might think that's where people are headed. Then you get to a place where it's clearly expedient to smash the machine because the whole purpose of the machine is something bad. But instead, there's this other thing that's concerned. So that, that, I mean, that made so much sense that I actually hallucinated him saying that. <laughs> but he does. He says it does the third thing. And moreover, like it seems like from the thing about Haley, like this third thing is not the case where it's so clear that it's expedient to smash the machine. Rather, it's a case where it's clear that expediency has nothing to do with it. Um, I'm not sure I know how to, how to make this work. Um, by which I mean, well, it's always hard to know what to do as a philosopher. Um, in the case of Thoreau, I feel like it, I feel, I guess I would say particularly strongly in the case of Thoreau, that if there's something I don't understand and doesn't make sense to me, it's probably because Thoreau understands something that I don't. <laughs> so like, I'm not saying that the criticism of yeah, I'm saying that the criticism of myself, but like I'm not sure how to put these things together. Um, maybe if I think about it longer, I'll think of something. How much time is that? There's still time. So, I mean, okay. I guess, well, so, I mean, there's one other thing to say about this, whether I understand the details of it or not. Um, the fact that expediency is not supposed to apply in these cases means that um, Thoreau's argument is not, or Thoreau's position is not um, that, let's say that like working within the system will be less effective than, than refusing to acknowledge the authority of the system. Right, so as if you were to say to Thoreau, look, like if you really want to abolish slavery and end the Mexican-American War, what you should be doing is making political contributions to, um, uh, you know, um, running for office, like whatever, voting at least, right? At least vote, Thoreau, if you really care about this. And, um, and he's, you know, he's not willing to do any of those. But the reason isn't because he thinks those things are ineffective, because he thinks this isn't a situation where you're supposed to consider what would be effective. <laughs> um, that, you know, that like if someone says, well, you have to be, um, to have a better chance of ending this war, you have to acknowledge the authority that's behind it to a certain extent, and then you'll be able to work with that to end it. Um, right? So from the point of view that we care about the consequences, that's a perfectly good argument. It's a really reasonable argument. Um, like, which, you know, like, like you could, you could imagine saying to him, Thoreau, this is so selfish. We're going to see him, the like people saying to this, to him and Walla, right? But Thoreau, this is so selfish. In order to just to wash your hands of this injustice, 
you're like not involving yourself in the activities that could actually end. But I mean, so like, um, you don't have to say that to Thoreau because he says it himself in this essay, right? Like he literally says, he, he says like, I don't think everyone's obliged to solve every problem in the world. Everyone has their own business. So that's also part of this confidence thing, this, this um, that the right thing to do is to follow the nature that's been given to you. So, um, you know, Thoreau has business to transact. Right? I mean, what that means exactly, I mean, that, that's, that's how he's going to describe it in Walden. He says, I went down to Walden because it seemed like a good place to transact certain business. <laughs> Thoreau has, certain, has business to mind. Um, and, uh, you know, what's important is that he do everything that's his own business. Ending the Mexican War, not part of that. I mean, it could be for someone, but it, but it's not for Thoreau. That's not his business. So he says, but and, you know, so so, so he says it's, it's perfectly reasonable for a person to say, look, it's not. Uh, this isn't my problem. Me, not meaning it doesn't affect me. That's irrelevant. Right, meaning it's not part of my task that my own nature sets to me to end this war. Um, but he says, um, like, at least you have to wash your hands. <laughs> or as he puts it in another metaphor, he says, like, at least um, that it makes perfect sense to say that I can't be encumbered by these social obligations because you know my business is contemplation. But he says, first make sure that you're not riding on someone else's back as you contemplate. <laughs> Get off their back and then you can contemplate. Right. So um, um so again, like it has nothing to do with, with foreseeing consequences and calculating them against each other. And um, and what? <laughs> Um, I guess, so does this mean that um, Thoreau is not only against any kind of government or voluntary society, but that he ultimately thinks we can't help each other? Um, that we can't um everyone has to mind their own business. And that is that's literally a quote from Walden. Let everyone mind his own business. <laughs> um and the, therefore the reason he's against this expediency calculation, I mean So I mean, I'm trying to I'm trying to figure out which you guys may or may not be interested in whether it's the same as Kant's reason or different from Kant's reason, but um, but the reason he gives so like I wanted to say it this way: the workings of the uh, of the machine are irrelevant to one who takes a higher moral point of view because only moral force is really forced to a moral being. 
So I wrote that down and then I looked at what he actually said and I realized that he says it without ever using the word moral, <laughs> whereas I used it like six times, right? But this is what he says. This is on page 203. What force has a multitude? They only can force me who obey a higher law than I. They force me to become like themselves. So there is a way, um, there is a kind of um, social obligation or social duty, but, um, but, uh, there is a way that you can exert a force on other people, but the way you can do it is only by doing this more and more, <laughs> right? Like the more you try to be yourself. So, I mean, this is similar to what Emerson said. I, I think it's not quite the same because he doesn't talk about universal things here. Or he doesn't talk about when you look inside yourself, you'll find what's really common to everyone. I think that's Emerson's thought, and I think that Thoreau is is his mind. But so, I mean, you won't find what's common to everyone. You'll find what's specific to you, your own business. If you look deep enough, you'll find your own business. And the force that exerts on other people is, if any, is the force of um, um, example, or maybe I should say the force of paradigm, like the paradigmatic cause in the platonic sense, like this thing again about the superior person being a win. <laughs> okay. So that, like, when you blow down from your high point of view. Um, which, which is a metaphor, right? There's no physical force here, but when the when something comes down from from on high, you know, people are have to look up, converts them, it causes a revolution. Um, so that is what Thoreau is suggesting instead of political revolution, I guess. All right, sorry, I kept you a little bit over. And sorry, I was kind of discombobulated at certain time. <laughs> I'll see you on Thursday.